I'd like to welcome you this morning and welcome those that are now joining us on our live stream with Facebook. Today we will be continuing on our journey as we come to the book of Ezekiel. And so our scripture reading this morning will come from chapter 36 and we'll begin with verse 26. And as we read, as always, I would invite us to remember that this is the word of God. And this time the Lord is speaking, and he says, I will give you a new heart and put a new spirit in you. I will remove from you your heart of stone and give you a heart of flesh. And I will put my spirit in you and move you to follow my decrees and be careful to keep my laws. Let's pray as we seek God's guidance this morning. Lord, we come before you, inviting you to speak to our hearts. Lord, I come acknowledging I am utterly dependent upon you. And I know I can never teach this word without the anointing power of your spirit. So, Lord, I ask that you would just flood me with the power of your Holy Spirit. I ask, Lord, for your cleansing, that you would make me a vessel that is clean and fit for your use. For I acknowledge my transgressions to you. I pray for each one listening, Lord, and I ask that your Holy Spirit will speak to our hearts. You know exactly what each one of us needs to hear today. And so, Lord, we know that it's your spirit that can speak to us. And so we invite you to come into our hearts and lives. Invade us with what you want us to hear. And it's in that precious name of our Lord Jesus that we pray. Amen. Ezekiel was born into a priestly family. He grew up in Judah, and as a young man, he experienced the trauma of being carried off into captivity in Babylon, along with the king, Jehoiachin, and about 10,000 others. At the age of 30, Ezekiel was to become a priest, and the Lord had other plans. Maybe you've experienced that. You think you have everything planned out and then the Lord intervenes with a totally different plan. And rather than becoming a priest, the Lord calls Ezekiel to be a prophet. Now it would have been much easier for Ezekiel to remain a priest. After all, the priests are highly respected and prophets on the other hand are not prophets are most often despised and one of the big reasons for that is that people don't like having their sins pointed out and that's what prophets do and so prophets are often seen as being intolerant or mean-spirited. And by the way, things haven't changed much. But you add to that that prophets are also misunderstood. Especially Ezekiel. You take his stunning visions and his symbolic acts and they caused him to be misunderstood. He was thought to be strange. In fact, even today, there are some modern scholars that will suggest that Ezekiel was mentally ill. And what amazes me is that even some modern theologians don't understand prophets. It's amazing how someone can profess to be 
an expert on the prophets in the Bible and you still don't understand them. And yet I think sometimes this misunderstanding is really more of an act of convenience. It's easy to dismiss someone if you see them as being weird or mentally ill. But you can't just dismiss a prophet. And so I think sometimes it's also that we can pretend that they're not proclaiming the actual word of God. And Ezekiel was the first of two prophets during the time of the Babylonian exile. The other prophet is Daniel, and we'll talk about Daniel next week. But Ezekiel prophesied during the first 22 years of that exile. He began prophesying seven years before the temple was destroyed. And then, of course, if you do the math for 15 years after that. And his book is built around three visions. And as soon as you begin reading this book, it opens with this dramatic and tremendous vision of God's glory and his throne in heaven. In verses 4 and 5 of chapter 1, we read, I looked, and I saw a windstorm coming out of the north, an immense cloud with flashing lightning and surrounded by brilliant light. The center of the fire looked like glowing metal, and in the fire was what looked like four living creatures. In appearance, their form was that of a man, but each of them had four faces and four wings. And so as Ezekiel has this vision, he begins and he sees these four living creatures each of them having four faces. The face of a man and an eagle and an ox and a lion. And they're highly symbolic. The face of a man symbolizes intelligence and understanding and wisdom. Well, at least most of the time. The face of an eagle represents power and deity. The face of an ox symbolizes servanthood and sacrifice. And the face of a lion depicts sovereignty. And one of the things that is so amazing is that when you look at the four accounts of the Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, they portray Jesus with these same four qualities. Matthew presents Jesus as the lion the sovereign king. Mark presents him as the ox, the servant, the sacrifice. And Luke portrays him as a man in his intelligence and in his insight and understanding. And John depicts Jesus as the eagle in his deity. And it's actually you have to take all four of these symbols to even come together representing the character of Jesus. Now, after this, Ezekiel sees these wheel-shaped objects. They're intersecting wheels, a wheel within a wheel, and he describes just how majestic they are. But they're not really separate from the vision of the four living creatures because actually they are alive. They're a part of the four living creatures. And these intersecting wheels allow them to move in any direction instantaneously without ever having to turn. And then above the four living creatures with these wheels within a wheels, he sees this large expanse. And it's above the living creatures, and it looked like sparkling ice. And it was awesome. And then above the expanse, he saw a throne. And it looked like sapphire. And the one seated on it had the appearance of a man 
glowing like metal full of fire. And it was surrounded by brilliant light. And it was surrounded by what appeared to be a rainbow. And then realizing that it was the glory of the Lord, Ezekiel fell face down. And Ezekiel's vision of this throne in heaven is very much like John's that we read about in the book of Revelation. John also sees four living creatures. He sees a throne in heaven surrounded by a rainbow with someone who is seated on it. Both Ezekiel and John have this vision of the greatness and the glory and the majesty of God. And after that powerful vision, the Lord commissions Ezekiel as his prophet, placing upon him that mantle of responsibility, simply saying, I am sending you. That ought to sound familiar. It ought to remind us of the Great Commission when Jesus told us to go and make disciples. There's really not much difference between saying, I am sending you and go. It's like when I was in school, if the teacher said, I'm sending you to the corner or go to the corner, it meant the same thing. You see, just as Ezekiel received a commission from God, we have received a commission as well. And Ezekiel's may have been accompanied with all of this drama and this intense vision of the glory of God and the throne of God in heaven. But it doesn't make our commission any less real or important. Just as Ezekiel, we've been commissioned. And then the Lord instructs him and he says, You must speak my words to them, whether they listen or fail to listen, for they are rebellious. In other words, he's telling Ezekiel, You're not responsible for how the people respond. You're simply responsible to go and to proclaim my message to them. And I think that ought to mean something to us when we think about the commission that we have from God. So often we think that when we are to go that we're responsible for how people are going to respond. And somehow we think that if somebody doesn't respond, maybe we're the ones that fail. When we don't go is when we fail. When we won't share is when we fail. We're not responsible for how they respond. We're simply responsible for taking the word of God and sharing it with others. And then the Lord gives Ezekiel a scroll. And he commands him to take it and eat it. Sounds strange, doesn't it? And so what does Ezekiel do? Well, I hope he did what you would do. The Lord commanded you to take the Bible and eat it. Hopefully that's what you would do. And so Ezekiel takes the scroll and he eats it and he says, So I ate it and it tasted as sweet as honey in my mouth. In fact, that's how the psalmist describes the word of God. How sweet are your words to my taste, sweeter than honey to my mouth. And I think as disciples of Jesus Christ, it's reminding us of the importance of us getting into the Word of God and that His Word ought to be sweet to us. And when He's eating it, it gives us this tremendous image that we're to be digesting the Word of God, not through our stomachs, but through our minds and into our heart and spirit incorporating it within ourselves to where it becomes a part of us. And then in the next section, we find Ezekiel's vision of God's judgment. And the Lord begins with a lesson on responsibility. 
the first thing that he addresses is Ezekiel's responsibility. And so we really need to listen to this because as we've been commissioned, our responsibility is not any different. The Lord says in chapter 3, verse 18 and following, When I say to a wicked man, you will surely die, and you do not warn him or speak out to dissuade him from his evil ways in order to save his life, that wicked man will die for his sin, and I will hold you accountable for his blood. But if you do warn the wicked man, and he does not turn from his wickedness or from his evil ways, he will die for his sin, but you will have saved yourself. Wow. Wow. See, that's responsibility, isn't it? That's the responsibility that we have concerning the commission that Jesus gave us to go and make disciples. That if we don't go, people are going to die. And when they die, if they don't know Christ, they're going into eternity without Him. And we need to understand, when they go into eternity without Christ, they're going into an eternal hell. And he says, I will hold you accountable. That's called responsibility. We are our brother's keeper. Now, a little later... God instructs Ezekiel concerning personal responsibility and accountability. He's addressed his responsibility as a prophet, our responsibility as disciples. But then he also talks about personal responsibility and accountability. In chapter 18, he says, The soul who sins is the one who will die. The righteousness of the righteous man will be credited to him, and the wickedness of the wicked man will be charged against him. But if a wicked man turns away from his sins, he has committed and keeps my decrees and does what is just and right, he will surely live. He will not die. None of the offenses he has committed will be remembered against him. Do I take any pleasure in the death of the wicked? Rather, am I not pleased when they turn from their ways and live? You see, in this passage about all of this accountability and how we're personally accountable, you still hear that tremendous message of God's love, His grace and forgiveness. God doesn't take any pleasure in anyone going into eternity without Christ. He takes no pleasure in anyone spending eternity in hell. What is he looking for? He's looking for people who will actually turn to Jesus Christ and experience the forgiveness of their sins and allow him to transform their lives. That's why he sent his son. Then Ezekiel announces a series of prophecies that deal with Israel's failures. Now, really, as we read through that, we ought to remember that this isn't the time for us to judge Israel. It's a time for asking, am I guilty? Because their sins actually are just an example of the same sins that we all are committing. It's the sins of the world as well. And then Ezekiel has a vision and he sees the glory of the Lord departing from the temple. It begins once again with him seeing a vision of a throne in heaven. And the four living creatures in the intersecting wheels... And this time he identifies the four living creatures as cherubim. And then he sees the glory of the Lord in the temple. 
and it begins rising up and leaving the inner court and crossing the threshold as it goes into the outer court and moving through the threshold of the outer court of the temple, moving towards the east gate, then moving towards the Mount of Olives and then upward towards the sky. And the glory of God has departed from his temple. And so he begins by talking about this absence of the presence of God because of the people's rebellion. He talks about how God has struggled with his people. He says in verse chapter 12, verse 1, they have eyes but they do not see, and ears to hear, but do not hear, for they are a rebellious people. He tells how the Lord has been striving to get their attention because he wants to bring them back into a right relationship with him. Maybe you've even experienced that. The times when we have strayed away from the Lord, and how his Holy Spirit strives with us, trying to get our attention, getting us back on the right path. And he wants his people to understand that without him, they are doomed to foolishness and degradation. That without him, they're going to experience heartache and punishment. And all of this is so that he can bring them to their senses. And to get their attention, he has Ezekiel present his message in these dramatic and symbolic ways. Then Ezekiel announces the coming judgment of the Gentile nations. And he takes up a lament concerning the king of Tyre. And as you read through this, it very well may be a description of the fall of Satan. Listen to this. Chapter 28. You were the model of perfection, full of wisdom and perfect in beauty. I know he's not talking about me. You were in Eden the garden of God. Every precious stone adorned you. You were appointed as a guardian cherub, for so I ordained you. You were blameless in your ways from the day that you were created till wickedness was found in you. Through your widespread trade, you were filled with violence and you sinned. So I drove you in disgrace from the mount of God, and I expelled you, O guardian cherub. Your heart became proud on account of your beauty, and you were corrupted, I'm sorry, and you corrupted your wisdom because of your splendor. So I threw you to the earth. I made you a spectacle. All the nations who knew you are appalled at you. You have come to a horrible end and will be no more. And then you come to the last section of Ezekiel, the third vision. And it is a vision concerning the restoration of Israel. Remember, they're going into captivity but he's also promising God's presence. And so Ezekiel presents the grace of God in a powerful vision of God restoring the dead. The Lord takes him and he asks him what he sees, and it's a valley full of dry bones. And then at the command of God, the bones begun, are joined together again. And yet there's no breath in them. And then God breathes on them, and they come to life. And it's a picture of what God intends to do for the nation of Israel. In fact, he goes on in chapter 37, and he says, 
I am going to open your graves and bring you up from them. I will bring you back to the land of Israel. I will put my spirit in you and you will live. It's a picture of new life. Not only is it a picture of Israel, really it's a picture of what God does for us. Because we're dead in our sins and transgressions as well. And because of Jesus Christ, when we come to know him, he breathes new life into us. And when you come to know Jesus Christ, his spirit comes and lives within us. And he gives us that saying, I will put my spirit in you and you will live. And then Ezekiel looks into the distant future. He sees the final attack against the people of God, Israel. And when Israel's enemies come against them, they will be met with heavenly forces that will utterly destroy them. I've shared with you, God's not through with Israel. They're still his chosen people. God has not abandoned Israel. Israel. And I pity anyone who comes against them. And then Ezekiel sees the restoration of the temple and the glory of the Lord returns to the temple. Once again, it's that promise of the presence of God. And the book closes with this tremendous vision of God's throne. I love this passage. I want to share it with you. It's 12 verses in chapter 47. He says, The man brought me back to the entrance of the temple, and I saw water coming out from under the threshold of the temple toward the east, for the temple faces east. The water was coming down from under the south side of the temple, south of the altar to hold on to that he then brought me out through the north gate and led me around the outside to the outer gate facing east and the water was flowing from the south side as the man went eastward with a measuring line in his hand he measured off a thousand cubits now a cubit's roughly 18 inches it's from the tip of your elbow to the tip of your finger and then he led me through water that was ankle deep. He measured off another thousand cubits and led me through water that was knee deep. He, led, he measured off another thousand and led me through water that was up to the waist. He measured off another thousand, but now it was a river that I could not cross because the water had risen and was deep enough to swim in. A river that no one could cross. And he asked me, son of man, do you see this? Then he led me back to the bank of the river. When I arrived there, I saw a great number of trees on each side of the river. And he said to me, this water flows towards the eastern region and goes down into the Arba, that is the desert, where it enters the sea, that is the Dead Sea. When it empties into the sea, the water there becomes fresh. Swarms of living creatures will live wherever the river flows. There will be large numbers of fish because this water flows there and makes the salt water fresh. So where the river flows, everything will live. Fruit trees of all kinds will grow on both banks of the river. Their leaves will not wither nor will their fruit fail. Every month they will bear because the water from the sanctuary flows to them. Their fruit will serve for food and their leaves for healing. That is really a vivid picture of what new life in Jesus Christ looks like. Jesus said, if anyone is thirsty, let him come to me and drink. And whoever believes in me, as the scripture said, streams of living water will flow from within him. 
And so Jesus is that river of life. And one of the first things that river did as it flowed through the temple was it went past the altar. And the altar is the place of sacrifice. You see, that's the way of the cross. And then the river grows quickly. As it begins flowing down that valley, it grows and it grows, and yet he doesn't mention any tributaries. Now, it's natural for rivers to grow. That's what rivers do. But there's usually something flowing into them. And this one just seems to miraculously grow. And it's an illustration of what discipleship looks like. God leads Ezekiel step by step. Five times Ezekiel says, He led me. And each step takes him a little deeper. You see, that's what's supposed to be happening in our spiritual lives. It all begins at the altar, that place of sacrifice. And the first step that he takes in this living water is ankle deep. That's when you're coming to experience that grace of God. But if you'll notice, God doesn't want us staying in ankle deep water. When we come to know Jesus Christ, he's wanting us to go deeper in that relationship with him. And so he led him to water now that was knee deep. And that's when we come to that place of hungering and thirsting after God. It's when we're wanting to seek his face. It's no, longer when, it's no longer when we're satisfied with just being a Christian. But we want a deeper experience with God. Next he leads him into water that is waist deep. If you notice the water is starting to possess more of him. And he's starting to become less of himself. He's getting more and more into this experience that he has with God. And it's less of him and more of God. And then he takes him for his final plunge. Now the water is over his head. And that's when we become fully committed to God. And I know this scares some people. But when you become fully committed to God, one of the things you're going to realize is I am in way over my head. And that's when it becomes a place of total dependence upon God. I can't do this on my own. And it means we have become immersed in God. And that's the goal of discipleship to where we finally come to that place where every part of our life is committed to Him. We wouldn't think about making a decision without consulting Him. And we want Him glorified in everything we do. Now this river of life also affects the land. It's become fruitful. Its barrenness has been healed, and everywhere the river flows, it brings life. And it's the same vision that John sees in Revelation 22. Listen to this. Then the angel showed me the river of the water of life, as clear as crystal, flowing from the throne of God and the Lamb down the middle of the great street of the city. On each side stood the tree of life bearing 12 crops of fruit, yielding its fruit every month. And the leaves of the trees are for the healing of the nations. See, it's an illustration of what discipleship looks like. But it's also a vision of what life looks like in the kingdom of God. The life that has been promised to those who have surrendered themselves at that altar of sacrifice and given themselves to Jesus Christ and accepting his work of atonement. 
And he's preparing us now for what awaits us in the not-so-distant future. Let's pray together. Lord, we come before you and we thank you and we praise you for your word. Lord, we thank you for what we've learned through Ezekiel. We praise you for the life that we have through you, through that river of life, through our Lord Jesus Christ. Lord, we thank you for the tremendous visions that Ezekiel has had as to what it looks like in your kingdom. Many of them confirmed through what John saw as well. Lord, we want to be responsible disciples and to follow the commission that you have given us to go and make disciples. And it's in that precious name of Jesus we pray. Amen. And I invite you to stand.